everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm happy to welcome back Karen Wang um, from the New Museum here at Google um, and this great topic of designing bathrooms and gender fluidity. So I'll hand it over to Karen. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Thanks, Anthony. Um, so it's uh, great to be back here. And um, I think um, most, most of you folks, um, if you've been here over the last year, uh, we started with um, what our museum's going to look like in the 21st century. We then went into um, immersive environments. And um, this has uh, been another um, topic which I've been uh, fascinated by uh, because of its political, cultural, and social ramifications. And so I'm super lucky to have uh, some experts with me today, which include uh, Dan Wood of Work um, AC and Lauren Johnson and Ryan Day of QSpace, who are both going to be um, giving us um, some presentations, and then we'll have um, a quick conversation amongst everyone about where we are with uh, bathroom design and gender fluidity. But what I wanted to do was just start everybody off and make sure everyone was on the same page. So um, what we have here is in February of 2016, Charlotte, North Carolina, the city council wanted to introduce a bill which would allow um, for uh, transgender people to use bathrooms that match their gender identity. And so what happens, though, is in March 2016, the North Carolina Legister uh, meets to discuss the HB2, the, um, this bill uh, which would require people to use the bathrooms of their birth gender, what is on their birth certificate. And um, when it was introduced, it was passed and signed in the same day, which kind of just provides the um, kind of momentum um, the conservatives of North Carolina had. Uh, one month later, the ACLU um, uh, uh, basically um, files a lawsuit um, against HB2. Um, which they felt uh, violate, violates Title IX of the Civil Rights Act, which um, bars discrimination based on sex. Um, and then what you have um, a month later is uh, characters like Bruce Springsteen pulling out of um, a major concert out of Charlotte and PayPal, which was going to build um, a new uh, global headquarters in Charlotte, also um, leaving uh, uh, North Carolina because of this um, issue. And then um, I think to a great surprise of many of us, Adam Silver pulled out the All-Star Game in July. And I, I throw this slide up because if anybody else is like a basketball geek like myself, um, I was fascinated by uh, why the NBA would take such a stand. The first time uh, any player uh, came out as gay was not until 2013, uh, which is Jason Collins um, there in, on the Sports Illustrated cover. So again, um, just suggesting that the momentum around these issues have really um, only uh, really kind of coalesced in, in the last um, three to five years. And then, um, oh yes, I wanted to just make sure we knew who all these characters were. Yes, so on the, yes, so I wanted to make sure we understood that the one with the American flag behind him, that's Pat McCory. He's the one who signed the bill into legislation. He's a Republican, and he lost to the Democrat um, at the end of that year in 2016. Um, to uh, Ray Cooper, um, who was then the Attorney General. And then in March 2017, a year later, the General Assembly appro approved a compromise bill that repeals um, the House Bill too. Um, so it's, it's interesting that, you know, that much um, kind of uh, traction happened in really less than a year. And now, so this is where we are right now. Uh, I just pulled some of the signage uh, that um, many different institutions are using. And so we go from gender neutral to all gender restrooms. And you can see the, the now three characters, the three symbols that folks are using. Uh, then we get into these kind of more lengthy explanations, almost essays like to explain uh, why these bathrooms uh, are now considered you know, gender neutral or inclusive. 
And uh, then you have these ones where we just don't care, which kind of takes a more humorous attitude to a new symbol, which is inclusive, which is that, that one that you see on, the, um, on, the, on my right-hand side, which um, could use um, definitely some, some better design. And then, um, and then there's this new kind of path where folks are suggesting maybe you just show uh, what quote unquote equipment is in each bathroom to decide which is the most appropriate bathroom you should be using. And, um, and then I thought, ah, wouldn't it be interesting just to understand, um, has anybody asked the transgender community to design uh, bathroom signage, and then what would they come up with? Uh, and this is from um, the very known art, uh, very well known art collective, Motha, and uh, they designed um, this spectrum. So essentially, uh, you could be anywhere on the spectrum. You can decide which bathroom is most appropriate for you. And then in this case, uh, New Orleans uh, uh, transgender artist who just wanted to make something that was uplifting and he felt that everybody liked dolphins. Um, <laughs> so that, that's, that's, where we're, that's where we're at right now. And I'm super excited to pass uh, this discussion over to Lauren and Ryan who are going to talk about their work and um, how they're leading the charge in terms of how we should be thinking about bathroom design. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Lauren, and this is Ryan, and we're QSpace. And first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about ourselves as a um, as a practice, and then we'll talk about our coded plumbing project. So QSpace is a queer architecture research and design collaborative. We define ourselves as mixing queer theory, social justice, and design practice. So aside from coded plumbing, QSpace is a platform for research projects by students and professionals working on queerness in the built environment. So we organize social and speaking events as well as work with students to start their own LGBTQ groups in architecture schools across the country. So we ourselves started as a student organization um, called QSAP, Queer Students of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at GSAP, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at Columbia, um, and we <laughs> formed it in response to what we viewed as a huge lack of conversation for, um, and mentorship from openly queer folks in our field of architecture. Um, just a side note on, on being openly gay in architecture, um, if you try Googling gay architect, this is the first hit um, on Google. Um, so somehow this is your fault, no. Um, so this, threat, this is a 2009 Archonnect forum that um, speculates on the sexuality of several male architects and whether or not their sexuality affects their body of work and some timing in to denounce the threat as outing. So there's kind of a huge lack of conversation. Um, so aside from social events, QSAP provided a, a space for LGBTQ students at Columbia, um, brought lectures and programming that reinforced the impact of queer people in the field. And now we're up to uh, the North Carolina House Bill 2. So when that happened, we decided we needed to be proactive and that these bathroom bills were politicking queer people in space and that the bathroom bill issue was a design challenge that we had to look into. So QSpace was launched and our passion for the bathroom and coded plumbing began. <laughs> so um, HB2 and other bathroom bills specifically define gender as biological sex and dictate that people must use the, ba um, the bathroom corresponding to their birth certificate. And in states like North Carolina, to get your birth certificate changed, you would actually have to have a gender reassignment surgery. So that's there's a lot of like um, social financial barriers to having your birth certificate changed. Um, and what these bills do is they criminalize transgender and gender nonconforming folks, putting them in impossible and um, sometimes violent situations. And as architects, we began to investigate how gender binaries and the codes which govern architectural production could be reimagined and also subverted in the physical space of the bathroom. So the way we done this was through two exhibitions where we um, put the codes at a one-to-one -one scale in the spaces so people could actually understand the spaces that they're using and how architects are follow these different rules to build these spaces, which we'll explain later with the splash zones and the and distances that urinals have to be um, 
separated from each other. So by coupling these codes with actual bathroom bills, we emphasize the biopolitical dictation of gender and sexuality in spaces that are typically considered banal. So then on a grant, we um, traveled to North Carolina to do some site research on how HB2 was inspiring a bathroom resistance movement. And um, we met with LGBTQ leaders, it's so hard to say when you're in front of people for some reason, um, and individuals to discuss how the bill was impacting their communities. Um, so what we discovered was that there was a lot of open resistance declaring, um, like in the signage, declaring safe spaces, all sort of um, attempts to express inclusivity. I mean, we mostly spent time in like the urban areas um, so more there, um, less in the rural areas. But we discovered that a single stall locking facilities were the current sort of like most safe spaces in the current system. But there was like signage like this that was encouraging and it could be an effective way to put a Band-Aid on a prevailing, the prevailing two-gendered system. And then just to go on about these signs as well and the ones that you saw earlier, there was a massive backlash against the half um, male, half female character of trying to describe a trans person as half of one, half of the other. And that's why when we spoke to lots of people, it's the fixtures and what's behind this room became important within the signage. Um, but we also learned that the bathroom bill um, and gendered seg segregated facilities didn't just b burden trans and gender non-conforming folks, but they also affected families and, and people with disabilities who have opposite sex caretakers. You could no longer go into the same bathroom together. So we found three main types of bathrooms, all with varying degrees of separation. And the signage indicates who can enter while the public determine if you made the correct choice with the door you selected. So the all-inclusive restroom where everyone can relieve themselves, wash our hands, and whatever else we do in there is an important step to designing more inclusively. And architects can design and fight for these spaces. So just to sort of go over specific ways in way which um, not only codes, but design, so best practice standards, or um, affect the way that bathrooms are gendered. So like on the left, we have a, a men's room. Um, You'll see, you know, you can kind of make a choice. You could go into the urinal or you can go into a, a stall, which um, for a little more visual privacy, but yet yeah, stalls are usually pretty much open sounds and smells. Um, and there's like a, you know, a splash zone dictated around the urinals. And so these things are really like codified into design standards. And on the right, you have a women's restroom, which will almost always be all stalls. Um, probably always. Um, and there's other little, little things um, like women's bathrooms have trash cans between each stall um, for feminine products and a shelf below the mirror um, for like our handbags so we can like do our makeup. Um, and so there's things like that that you probably don't even notice that are really built into the code and the design standard. Um, so, but really if we strip it all away, it's just fixtures, convenient ways to eliminate waste. Um, wash your hands, check your look on the way out the door. Um, so we wanted to think about how these fixtures could be reassembled and reimagined, and how can we untangle these sort of Victorian notions of gender and privacy and create something that reflects um, an expanding understanding of gender and inclusivity. So the way that we're going about this is um, central to our practice, which is we believe design can and should play an active role in responding to social change. And we um, hope to offer the tools in which to create it. So this, um, for those uninitiated, is a typical CAD block package. Um, architects download things like this. They plug them in to, um, they plug in the elements to compose spaces that are kind of considered standard, such as fire stairs, furniture configurations, and yes, even whole rooms like bathrooms. Um, so as our output for coded plumbing will in include CAD blocks, 3D models, signage, and written guidelines. Um, and the f our free and online toolkit will offer al alternative solutions empowering architects with the tools to become better advocates for inclusive design. So sort of like redrawing these standard things in a more inclusive way because architects are lazy and they will just download standard 
padlocks and plug them in. So here we're like, here's a better one. And we're also <laughs> going to try and sneak in there um, to change the representation within architecture. So scale figures, if we can offer more queer figures, such as the iconic RuPaul. And these were seen constantly within architectural representation. That's a laser pointer. Um, so. so as we begin to bring these different branches of coded plumbing together, and we're beginning to join forces with lots of other designers working on this end goal of, as we say, peeing where you want to, we are continuing to focus on broader goals of conversations in the queer community. So um, we're just beginning to build the Queer Architecture Archive. It's an online archive of architecture and urban planning projects on queer topics in the built environment. So we're hoping to seek the, you know, going back to that 2009 Archonnect Forum of like speculating the gayness of architects. So we're trying to broaden the field of architectural discourse by reinterpreting its history and shining a light on its lesser known works and figures. We want the archive to establish a queer body of work, not just from queer identified designers, but on projects that impact queer identities. Um, oops, I meant to take that slide out. Um, so yeah, thank you. We just want to say thank you for Karen for inviting us. Pleasure to talk with Dan and Google for having us. This is really cool that you're hosting this conversation. Thank you. Dan. OK, wow. great. Finally. I don't know. <laughs> I was going to meet with these guys before to make sure that what I was presenting was correct or good, but we didn't have that opportunity. So we're going to have an onstage critique following this. Um, so I'm Dan Wood from Work AC, uh, founded in 2003 with my partner Amal Andraus. These are the rules that we set out uh, back in 2003, and I thought it would be interesting to put them. But especially uh, number three, the inside is different from the outside than the outside. Um, and that's something that's really driven our practice. So we are really interested in diversity and difference. And I think embracing the uniqueness of things is really important to our practice. And also, for us, that's been a way that we've addressed um, bathroom design in general, and, and especially with our project that I'll show you at the end for RISD, um, for the first kind of commissioned um, um, Commission genderless bathroom that that we've been involved with at least. Um, so in projects like this, you see how you know we kind of like to play with the different, it, almost like an onion skin, where different things are exposed the closer you move to the center, for example. But even in projects like this, this is Diane von Furstenberg's headquarters down the street. You know where the old facade um, basically. Um, opens up to this kind of completely contemporary space inside with this stair that links all the different floors. Um, and we're also just interested in this idea of surprise and um, the unexpected. Um, and so this is a project for Wyden and Kennedy, the ad agency, um, where we cut a number of holes in the floors to connect the, uh, the building in different ways. And then, so that was under construction. This is what it looks like. So. Um, I mean, I'm just kind of like introducing the work as a way of like really thinking through this idea of surprise and change. And, and for us, that's a way to make people think differently about how to live in the city, that we really want to provoke reactions by making people think differently about space, also nature in a lot of projects, um, but also bathrooms. So um, this is a condo project, for example, similar where we had to build an invisible rooftop penthouse. Um, and in our bathroom projects, you know, I, I had never really thought about it because every project has a bathroom, but I've never really looked at them on their own. Um, but for us, it's always been a, a place of experimentation. Um, so we've done egg-shaped bathrooms for a client whose logo was an egg on the on the left. Um, we've done round bathrooms for the Children's Museum of the Arts on the right. Uh, bathrooms that explore pattern and difference. And I think for us, it's kind of it's always this. I, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a person of the 80s and 90s, and Philippe Stark was always known for doing these incredible bathrooms, and would be like, if you go there, you have to check out the bathroom. So for us, it's like, it's always this place where it's like, you want this kind of like unexpected thing to happen. Um, and then this is these are the kids' bathrooms from the Children's Museum of the Arts, which in children's architecture, which we do a lot of work in, it's always genderless, like, because it's always about the parents, and you got to go in, you need space, and you need the sink, and everything. So. Um, I think maybe in working with kids, we've also been in. And then this is the Sinkorama 
um, that we designed also for the Children's Museum, where this kind of very, they, they said they couldn't get kids to clean up or wash their hands, so we tried to make it something that all the kids would want to do. This is operated by foot pedals, and each of those little things is a, is a faucet, and it's all one big sink. Um, and then this is a project that we did um, as part of that condo, where the bathrooms, um, we created this being John Malkovich scaled um, semi-apartment. There's only two and a half feet at the top, but we put a bed up there and a place to sit, and there's an herb garden over the kitchen, and then this fern garden, and that's over the roofs of the bathrooms. And then the fern garden um, is connected to the master bathroom, so that when you take a shower, uh, the steam from the shower waters the plants, so as long as you stay clean, the plants stay alive. Um, <laughs> So I mean, we've I guess we've done a lot of exploration in bathrooms without ever thinking about it. Is, is way. And then we worked with tiles and patterns to bring a little bit of nature into these these rooms as well. So for RISD, this is the building that we're working on. It's like the most boring building, and they keep saying it's a historic building, even though it was built in like 1960, and it drives me crazy. <laughs> like this is a building of historic importance to Providence, which has like got really old buildings, but. Um, so we're fighting a little bit with landmarks on this one. But um, we're gut renovating the entire ground floor to provide a student space. And what's interesting in working with universities now is that it's very student focused. I mean, at least different from when I went to school. You guys are probably more used to it. But it's really it's all about you know creating a better experience for the student. Um, and since RISD is an art school, you know they're also very wary of being too corporate or too standard or too um, boring, and so even though this is a place for the registrar and the finance, finance department and career services, they really wanted to reflect the artsiness and the creativity of the school um, within this boring building. So um, it's a much larger project, but just generally, so we it's an L, uh, a U-shaped plan, and we have a kind of space on the left, which is this advising center, um, and then on the right is Career Center, which is very important in an art school so that you can convince the parents of prospective students that <laughs> their kids are going to have a job. Um, and, um, and then what we've done in the middle is create a, a bunch of more flexible spaces for gathering, for events. Uh, there's an art gallery. Every building at RISD has a gallery. It's kind of like Bushwick. Um, and, um, and, um, uh, and spaces to lounge. There's a ca cafeteria, et cetera. Um, and the bathrooms are um, right in the middle of everything. And so RISD said, you know, we don't want the same old bathrooms. We want genderless bathrooms. They showed us their genderless bathrooms, which they were very proud of, which are paired, and one has urinals, and one has stalls, and one has the mirror with the shelf, and one doesn't. But they're both genderless. And I said, I think we could do better than that. Um, and, um, and then there's a big auditorium in the back. So this is a place where lots of people are going to come. And so for us, the idea was, and, and this is a safe space. I also wanted to say it. It's a kind of an easy project because they are very interested in inc inclusivity and, and difference and things. And so this is the kind of atmosphere we're working in. So the idea of the bathrooms is that you go in. There's no, I mean, I think we're still working through the sign, but it's just going to say bathrooms, I think. Um, um, which is already a misnomer because there's no bath, but um, <laughs> but the idea is that it, there are these just different colored um, glass where you get a, a sense of the space beyond, but they're sealed, so you're not hearing noises or, or anything. And in the middle, we're we've created this mega sink, which is every standard Corian sink size that we can get. Um, so the idea is like. Not only do you pick your bathroom that you are comfortable with, you can also pick your sink and your faucet that you're comfortable with as well. And so when you open one of those doors, each bathroom has a different shape. So for us, it's really about not, not making anything specific, making everything unique, and allowing this kind of choice. So if we were to put you know, signs on each stall, you know, it could be funny. We maybe just put the shape of the room uh, that's behind. So you can pick a triangle or a house shape or a, an arch or a circle or an, an ellipse. Um, and so then each one, then, you know, this one, one of them is a handicapped size, or maybe two of them, I can't remember. Um, and we're still thinking through. Ryan suggested we put mirrors in each of them, which now I'm going to do. Um, and each one has a different color. And that's the, this, uh, another synchorama at the end. That's it? I think. Oh, yeah, there's another one. Very cool. Um, I mean, it, it, it was, it's not lost upon me that um, for the third talk here at Google, um, 
on some ways, I wanted to drill down on a topic um, that was very specific. Um, and I actually uh, thank Anthony for allowing um, this particular topic, and which also I've had, this is the smallest audience as well. So I want to thank you guys for, for showing up. But in many ways, you know, the reason why I brought these architects is, you know, um, one who's looking um, at speculation and doing research and looking at code, and then one who is manifesting. Um, I do hope that this could actually uh, start to have Google thinking, particularly you, um, many in uh, UX design, user experience. Um, it, it could be quite amazing that if a small group of you uh, decided to become a task force and you demanded um, you know, some really great thinking around bathroom design in your new headquarters, I think you guys could be um, emblematic of a, of a movement uh, that could um, really energize the nation. So let's kick it off with the critique. Um, Ryan, Lauren, how would you critique um, what Dan is doing? And I believe it's going to be one of the first specific uh, gender neutral bathrooms designed for a client in the United States. So I have a question, which I know you've done it because it's in code, but in the square um, bathroom, you have the sink inside, yeah. but you, the main sink, communal sink, which I do think is, we've seen them everywhere, but they are going to be the future of like the communal washing, but it's still at the certain height, so a kid would struggle to use it, uh, someone in a wheelchair wouldn't be able to use it. So the idea of also varying the communal right. sink yeah, yeah, yeah. is um, one which I do think we also have to go into those minute details of understanding everybody who like uses the space of, they can use the choice of sink can also like varies in height. Like your yeah. the kids one I'm in love with, yeah. it's the first time I've seen it, um, but the idea that that's also accommodates to people at different heights and comfortable fit. Buddy, yeah. um, would be fantastic to see that built into this. Got it. Done. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about budget because having um, also um, been uh, been part of um, refurbishments or des uh, designs at, at our institution, you know, there's never actually enough money to bring the walls all the way down for the privacy, mm -hmm. and I think that's going to be such a component. Mm -hmm that when you are in these spaces, I think um, no matter uh, how one identifies oneself, privacy is the biggest issue, but it's also a budgetary issue. And I see here, everyone has their own room, which is like, you know, the gold ring of bathroom design, but what happens when, you know, it has to be back to stalls and you can only go, you can't bring it all the way down to the floor and you have that, you know, eight, 10 inches, which always makes you feel a little queasy. So, you know, where, <laughs> where are we gonna go with those kinds of problems? I think it's interesting to think about the, well, first of all, the biggest cost, I think one of the biggest cost prohibitive parts of having distinct rooms is that you have to sprinkler each room because it is considered, so, which is why they usually, stalls are cheaper. But one fact that's interesting about um, toe, what is it called, toe height? Toe height, yeah. Um, is that in a, like a, a standard adult bathroom? It's like eight, eight inches off the ground, but in a school facility for kids, it's twelve inches. And I think it, if you think about why, like what that really means, I think it dates back to like um, this fear of the bathroom or a fear that like something bad is going to happen or that we should be afraid in bathrooms or that we should be like afraid to be like undressed and that someone's gonna come in and sort of like victimize us. So I think there's like definitely some of that history in the, in the code. At least that's sort of like our theory, but um, going back to this, I think this is amazing because not just creating individual stalls for people where people can have, you know, um, some privacy and then come together in the communal sinks, which I think is a really important part of the moving forward with inclusive bathroom design, but that each room is so unique that you're never feeling, you get to have sort of a new sensory experience in each room and you're kind of like, there's like a delight and joy every time you go to the bathroom and just the fact that through all your projects there was some like delight and like joy and like surprise in every project, like that's sort of what we've been fighting against is just like this standardization of bathrooms like to the code and to kind of ignore it when for trans and gender non-conforming people this 
is a space of like major anxiety and contention and having to choose which room to enter. And so I think bringing some sort of like to like bringing it back to like a space of fun is. But then I want to ask, going back yeah. to your question about budget, I want to add on to that because it's something that we're trying to build is like how to convince the client. How did, apart from budget, how did you also convince them to put less stools in this space? Yes. Like, because you have, there's so much more, you could fit so much more in this space. Yeah. Right, that is true. But, um, I mean, this is what's required, and mm -hmm. I think, and we also just ran the calculations. The, the other good thing is it's all one RISD building, so mm -hmm. there are other bathrooms on other floors, and um, the Rhode Island code, at least, is a little bit forgiving on that. Um, but this should be fine, I think, you know, for the numbers of people we're talking about. But the budget question is interesting because we did, there's a thing called value engineering, which is like a term for slashing the budget to hell um, that happens in every project. Um, and we went through a major one on this project. And, you know, we cut every single thing. And then, but, you know, you, there are always things that are important to spend money on. And so we always try to look at the, these budget discussions holistically and say, these are the things that are really important. And we were able to convince the president of the university and the provost and er, the facilities department was not convinced, but they became convinced once the president was convinced. But this is an, a space, if they're concerned about students feelings of well-being and that they're accepted at the school, this is like where you're going to get them at the most intimate and the most emotional. And you know, they're going to experience this space in a way that they're not going to uh, a hallway or an awning or a signage. You know, And so we said, this is a really important space to spend some money. And so we propose not cutting the budget here at all. And we'll just cut it more other places. And um, you know, like the ceilings of the offices don't need to be nice. Like they could be open ceilings, which was what we proposed. So, um, so it was a it was a it was a choice. It, there's yeah. yeah, there's always yeah, a choice. Yeah. And in the end, you know, we're talking about five less than one, you know, one percent of the budget. I don't know. It's a tiny amount of money to go from stalls to doors, really, mm. in, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, but. I think in terms of like students' day-to-day -day experience, this is it's going yeah. to be important. But Lauren, I loved what you said too about um, the idea of the, the the anxiety or the stress that some folks have um, with their bathroom experience, and then Dan, how you've actually created something that is very you know that that we're seeing a trend in culture, which is to be very immersive, to be very experiential, and how fascinating that. You know, you you've taken um, a very kind of mundane ritual and elevated now into a, a situation. Well, you know, I could even imagine um, uh, being a student. You know, oh well, which bathroom will will I try out today? Which you know, I don't think any of us would have ever thought um, a couple of years a, years ago. Um, but maybe um, Lauren and Ryan talk a little bit more about um, you know just what's happening. Uh, in a, perhaps, a, uh, are there other um, organizations that are trying to be a little bit more systematic? Because I'm thinking again, um, the new museum, um, when this happened, of course, we also started to look at our own bathrooms. We looked at signage. We were looking at design. And you know, we spent almost like eight months talking about it internally, trying to come up with the right language, trying to like redo our signs. And um, ultimately, I thought, wow, you know, just a lot of wasted time if we had been able to go to some kind of, you know, city body or national body to get best practices. So, where 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 are we headed on that? Um, so, the national body is the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, or I'm not sure which way around the ASCO. Mm -hmm. um, but so the codes change next year. And it is predicted that um, we can go to non-gendered bathrooms that will be allowed. Um, but the problem is that we're discovering is to work with the AA is fantastic. They um, believe in this push. Well, the New York section that we work with believe in this push. So it's, but it is a massive institution. So it's very slow progress. And we had to fight, first of all, as a queer practice to not be pigeonholed to the diversity section, which is where we were constantly pushed um, from day one. So we've just 
slowly winning that battle to mm. begin this conversation. But then secondly, there's lots of architects who are working on this. So it's trying to bring everyone together because we are very separated at the moment. Everyone is doing their own thing. And that's why you see this range of signage, which I do enjoy the playfulness that you're seeing up here. But it's, I think you can talk more about Jules Sanders. Yeah, Jules Sanders is an architect who's doing a project called Stall that's similar to coded plumbing. And he, I, he's working with a lot of like higher education um, institutes. And I think and that's, lawyers. That, yeah, and, he, and I think that's a thing is like a lot of like universities are pushing for this, but museum institutions and I don't know, perhaps like Google Office, I don't know, like people that you would kind of expect. But I think what's interesting is that a lot of the gender like inclusive bathrooms you might find in New York City would be in like restaurants. And no one really talked about the fact that they were like, I don't know, you can picture tons of res restaurant bathrooms that are enclosed stalls with sinks in the middle and it was sort of not really a political statement but just sort of a nice atmosphere and then it was it, a space issue a space <laughs> issue too right yeah and then so it sort of became highly politicized so now a lot of you know universities are trying to be on the forefront but I think the angle we're working from um, for us is creating these CAD blocks to to encourage architects to advocate for inclusive bathrooms in all of their projects and so like maybe some uh, architecture student will download the CAD blocks and put one in their project. I mean, we t I totally use them all for my like bathrooms or just, uh, Ryan's had a professor that said just put a box that says bathroom and that you're good. Um, so just getting a, a, an architecture student in their studio to maybe put an inclusive bathroom in their project and like maybe it comes up in a crit and then maybe there's a conversation about it and then maybe they can convince someone else, and then when they go become a junior architect at, you know, they're like Ramza, that they can like push for that there. So I think that's kind of our methodology of trying to to um, make it more make it everyday conversation in yeah. studios. No, I totally agree because I mean I think there in New York we had so many great examples and mm -hmm. like restaurants, but also like. Dealer's Cafidio's Brasserie, which was one of my favorite, had men and women, and you go through, and then you're in the same room, <laughs> like yeah. as soon as you go through the door, which I always loved. Um, but and there was a club uh, in Chelsea that where the bathroom was on the facade, uh, and it was totally lit. That was kind of crazy, and obviously not gendered. Um, but um, yeah, but it, it, I think it's really true. Like you need Robert Stern to start designing them, right. and yeah. North Carolina State House, and <laughs> <laughs> in New York, it's a little easy. I mean, in in many ways, I can, I can just see you know, you guys are part of a revolution where I I used to the joke used to be that out of your first year of architecture school, you'd go to KPF and you'd have to design bathrooms for a year. <laughs> so now, wouldn't it be so amazing that you know that the bathroom actually became like, oh my God, I can't wait to design that bathroom. So. Um, with that, I'd like to open it up for a couple of questions. So uh, I think it's actually really cool to see the design exploration on the signage right now. Um, but on one hand, I'm actually kind of surprised uh, because I would expect that it should be kind of a solved problem, at least in niche places. Like I think of you know New York City's like gay center or like other places where they've had probably had this problem for a couple decades at least. Um, so. Why is it an unsolved problem? Like, are there pockets of designers who feel like this is my day? You know, I've been working on this for a long time. I yeah, I think it's just I think it we kind of like what we were saying. It gone through some growing pains of like the half man, half woman, and then people being like, is being a woman really just mean wearing a dress? And then so I think people are working. And I think what everyone's coming to is just if it is a if the sign is a band aid for an already two gendered uh, bathroom. The, just the fixtures is kind of what seems to be the growing consensus. I think since North HB2 passed, it's only been about what, a year and a half, two years. So it's, I think it's kind of getting there, but I think there's a lot more design exploration that can be done. I think there's a lot more design exploration, but it's still um, quite cultural. I mean, you would have thought at the new museum, um, we would have been able to solve this pretty quickly. I think we had a number of discussions because, um, um, you know, um, 
many of the folks ultimately who come into the museum. It's a very diverse population, which includes um, folks of different generations who aren't comfortable with um, this this movement. Um, it's also, you know, perhaps also a cultural difference where um, other um, ethnic groups, again, too, you know, don't um, feel so comfortable with um, uh, mixing men and women in the same spaces. So yes, I, I agree. I was at first um, quite surprised how um, how we weren't able to come to a consensus immediately, but um, there is just a there's a lot more complexity and discussion ar around this than than I had um, first thought. Yeah, and it's all legislated too. I mean, the signage there is signage in the code that you're supposed to use for bathrooms. You know, um, like how big the M is and the W. So um, it there is. I, I think it's easy in a place like you know the one you mentioned um, because of the audience whereas yeah. like we just did a we just opened a public library and it's a weird it's a time capsule project because the city takes t so long to build things so we designed it 10 years ago when this was not an issue and we have two paired bathrooms in the main section and two paired bathrooms in the kids section but the library decided now 10 years later we're not going to say men and women on them, but it was, again, this huge discussion how to do the sign. They went for the half man, half woman in the end. <laughs> but it even comes down to not just what to call these new bathrooms. Like when you said you're just going to go with bathroom. Because right. everyone we speak to, it changes from all gender. No, no, it's all inclusive. And the, just the amount that even the terminology has is still being discussed. Mm. Yeah. So we can't get down to the sign and the image when the language is yet to be decided. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you all. Um, what I'm really interested in going off the language around it is how you signal a safe space uh, for LGBT people in the restroom. Um, because I know there are some issues like, as you mentioned, there's the male female sign and then it comes into one bathroom. But a lot of LGBT people wouldn't even enter those doors because they're afraid of what harassment they may face behind them. Um, so essentially signaling a safe space, like in our gender neutral bathrooms here, we have a little like occupied sign that switches on when, so you don't even have to knock on the door because an issue may be that your voice is higher and they're not expecting you in there. Um, so, you know, what sort of ways are you thinking of signaling that this is a safe space for uh, people in those bathrooms? I just say one thing to go off that, like currently, it's, I found it very interesting when we came here and you have the male and the female sign, but there isn't a third sign of showing um, an all-inclusive bathroom mm -hmm. or a single-stalled bathroom, which I presume there is one close by to where we are, but there isn't that third sign put up. Mm -hmm. So that's currently what we can do and what we're encouraging people to do. When we sp spoke to people, it's you can always have to ask where that one is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like currently the, that's just in apps yeah. people are downloading to yeah, like, like find out where that is. Yeah, yeah, clear like, oh, signage to happen? find a single stall locking is really Im important. So people don't have to, yeah, like ask and just be able to know like, oh, you walk into a building and there's like, FYI, there's a single stall locking on the third floor. Mm -hmm. Like that you can just, you can just go straight there. Yeah. Um, that's important. I think that we've talked a lot about what safe space means. I think people ask us a lot is because we're like, a queer architecture practice. And um, I think the one thing that's really important is like putting a sticker on the door that says this is a safe space doesn't always make it so. Um, and a lot of that comes with like training and like the people in the space creating a safe environment. So I think it's kind of hard to stay in a bathroom, but like I'm thinking about the new museum, the signs, um, we spent a lot of time in that basement doing presentations down there and like the bathrooms down there have a really, it's really nicely worded and I can't say it exactly, but it's like, it's, it's still a women's bathroom, but it says we uh, want anyone to come in and express their gender, you know, something like that. And I think that sets a really nice tone for, okay, this is a gendered bathroom, but like I know that the security guard's not gonna pull me out of here, that everyone else entering this bathroom knows going in that this is the kind of space that the new museum is intentionally creating as an institution. Like, so like that kind of language really matters and I think has an impact. Yeah, or even like the app Refuge, where it's like other yeah. people in the LGBT community like messaging each other, like, oh, this is a bathroom that's gendered, but it's single stall, and you can go in, and you don't have mm -hmm. to pay to use it, or right. that sort of language around that community and mm -hmm. like incorporating that. I, I also wonder whether the humor isn't 
strategic? I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I was wondering what you guys thought. But like, you know, we often say, because we deal with humor in our work all the time, and we often say that, you know, people can start a very serious speech with a joke, you know, to kind of break the ice. And like, mm -hmm. we always feel like humor allows, it's a, it, it opens the door, it puts people in a, in a mood to think about things differently, because that's what humor is. And, you know, I, I feel like that might allow people to relax, you know, just you know, la laughing a little bit or saying, oh, this is different, you know, like. Mm -hmm. Well, you actually almost, yeah, I can see that in your work because mm -hmm. if we go take this language into an actual built thing, um, with your glass doors that you can almost see the space behind it is very important for, to understand what space you're entering. And I, Deborah Burke in her one, the whole glass front of the stall goes, it's completely clear and you can see everything. And then when you go in and turn the light or lock it, the whole thing will go opaque, um, which is actually That's very- the that, That sign that we don't care uh -huh. was an art. An artist put those in the, it's the bathroom. It's in North Carolina yeah. in this hotel. And it's, yeah, the way how you describe the, becomes like opaque, but the, the we don't care signs are, so it's a very humorous, almost art installation. But it's the way of explaining. It's just the architectural way of being like, this is exactly what is here. Yeah. Shall we go to this side for a second? Yeah, forgive me if I'm not familiar enough with this. You mentioned, uh, for example, at the sinks, you picked every single sink you could find and put them all into one <laughs> spot. Did the facilities people who looked at this just look at it and say, oh, gee, thanks? <laughs> <laughs> They're saying, yeah, they didn't say thanks, though, but yeah. <laughs> go back to the slide where you saw, there's a um, nicer slide where you can, yes, there you go. Yeah. I mean, they're all standard sinks, so that that I, I think that helps us a little bit. And sinks don't really need replacing. I'm trying to convince them faucets also don't get replaced that much, because their whole thing is they just they want to have like one room full of faucets and sinks that when something happens they can replace it very quickly. Are they um, all different faucets as well? I, I, we were we've going back and forth on that. I think we are showing some different faucets there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so in that case, it's also easy to replace. You just because it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think with the the sinks, they're they're there. It's really we are having a major discussion about hand towel dispensers right now. I can believe it because I didn't see that at all on your diagrams. <laughs> uh, either a spot for waste baskets or a place for paper towel dispensers. Oh. I saw a little cutout in the corner, which I thought might have like one of the pull down things. Yeah, but yeah. No, that's all. I mean, that's what architects do. We we don't. We you know we get more and more detailed as we go through it. But yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Shall we go back here? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, I was wondering about how do you have, have you considered the different ways in which you show that a room is, is, is occupied? You know, uh, like with the traditional stalls, it's usually easy if the door is open, it's unoccupied, and if it's closed, it is. Um, here in our gender neutral bathrooms, there will usually be a sign on the lock, but it's often uh, or it is sometimes the same color, it's white, it's low, it's hard to see if you're tall, mm -hmm. like what it says, and you feel, you feel as though you're being intrusive if you're like, you know, peering down at it. Mm. And with the, with the glass door situation, I can imagine that people would feel uncomfortable if you could see their figure, even if it's translucent, um, but how, how do you signal how do you signal those, and what mm -hmm. what might be some better ways to? Yeah, do that? no, I'm also interested to hear what these guys think because we were we were going to go for the occup the red and green, um, on the thing. I at first I wanted the we were we wanted the light to go on when you were mm -hmm. in so that um, that's clear. But then we thought it's also nicer if all the lights are on because then you see the colors a little better. Uh, so we're still going back and forth on that, but I'm interested to hear, because I think it is an important issue. Although, for me, the fact that the doors go all the way down to the ground makes it a little less uh, intrusive. The shadow thing, I have to think about that. It, these are pretty um, pretty opaque, yeah. We're going for almost almost opaque. It's um, So but anyway, I'm interested. One that I personally like, but I understand from a maintenance in issue, they're not going to like it, is the light bulb outside. like almost mm -hmm. like the on-air, off-air mm -hmm. aspect. I think that's a nice way to do it. Um, but it actually, when you do these doors all the way to the ground, it actually, it's the 
I think it's the reverse we need to think about of when you're leaving the stall. In the one set up, you sort of have an understanding of what's happening in the space outside you while you've been in there. But with the doors to the ground, you are actually entering a space of you don't know what's happening now mm. in this communal area. So it's the idea of, I know one architect, their proposal is a very low down one way mirror. So it's adding that bar back in, but like slightly higher. So you can see sort of out and understand what's happening out there. Um, I think that's actually what we need to figure out. Yeah. That, personally, I think the red, green occupied, you know, it's like pretty standard. It's what you see on an airplane. It's something pretty. Airplanes need to change their signage as well. I was thinking they that do, last yeah. time I was flying. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so true. Okay, okay. With a text. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With a text. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Can we go to that side? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, so this came up a little bit very briefly, uh, but it seems like most of the discussion has been around, like making everything single stalled and very, very, very private, um, which I I understand is like, is a great thing to have both in terms of safe space and just people who prefer more privacy, um, but. Uh, in my experience, I've found that often g gender neutral or all gendered bathrooms um, kind of help to m take the mystery out of the differences between genders <laughs> um, and uh, in, in a way that I think can, would be you know, useful to society. Is, has there been any discussion al along those lines of having normal stalled bathrooms but are, that are uh, all gendered? So you're saying with the open stalls? Yeah. Um, we went to one in North Carolina at a bar, remember, on our research trip? Oh, and yes, it, it was funny because, I mean, people were obviously drinking. It was like at a gay bar. And it was kind of a big F you to the HP2. And they, they had, I don't know if anyone knows that band, Gender Neutral Milk Hotel, but they had like gender neutral bathroom, uh, milk bathroom. Anyway, and like most of the time was spent of like, um, do, like people coming up to me being like, uh, can you believe we're all in the same bathroom together? <laughs> so it was kind of an interesting experiment. I don't know how that how that would like go down um, with people. Our big thing that we're trying to figure out and we're still going through it is um, how to get urinals in these spaces because they are very functional and efficient, efficient. sustainable, sustainable. sustainable. <laughs> like there is many benefits to them uh -huh. um, and it's how to keep those in a space with the added privacy and everyone feeling safe in that space. Mm -hmm. If you have any ideas, please tell us. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, I also, that is the one, there is actually a few bars in New York who have yeah. already it's have that thing. right now. Um, yeah. um, I also, I, you know, I practiced in Europe for 10 years and we were starting to do projects in the US and the thing that no one could believe was what, what the awesome. standard <laughs> bathroom was like in the US because in Europe it's quite common in any bathroom to have doors that go all mm -hmm. the way down. and. The, I mean, I think there's also just, it's, you know, it's kind of raw and cheap and, you know, I mean, the way that the bathrooms have developed in the U.S., if you go, like, e even just a German airport, like, those bathrooms are so awesome. You know, the door's, like, just totally <laughs> flush with the wall. Yeah, I think uh, it's, you know, it's like, we, the, just Americans are like, we just don't care about this. Yeah, and like we don't, you know, it's going to smell and there's going to be stuff mm -hmm. on the floor. I yeah, know. I think it's designers <laughs> are viewing it like they hate the stools, the how they look so much, and it's a chance to like write those out. Yeah. That, yeah. So let's take one la last question. Um. Uh, so I guess this is a little bit of feedback on the design. Is that okay? Can you get closer to the mic? Yeah, this is a little bit of feedback on the design. Is sure. that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so people think of, of handicap things as being about height, um, but it's actually how close can you get to the faucet? Um, so removing like that huge depth at the waist can take care of it, and then you don't need to, because um, I think the goal is to have a bathroom where you don't have to wonder which stall should I go into, and so we shouldn't be doing that to handicapped people either. Um, and so achieving that with the sinks, et cetera, and that'll free up some space for you to rearrange things, I think. Um, also, I wasn't sure what you meant by like the doors indicating what was inside of them so much because it seemed like all it was was like a correspondence of pink color, um, but the doors indicating nothing or whatever, I mean, is also playful and great. Um, yeah. Oh no, I meant like you would have like a s just a circle on the door, like as a s as a sign. 
Like, so you would know what the shape of the room was. Ah, uh, cool, okay. <laughs> that, that, but um, that, it's just an idea. And like there one other thing? I can't remember the other thing. If I remember, I'll talk to you after, I guess. Great. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for coming out during uh, lunchtime. And um, we'll, uh, we'll be hanging around just for a moment. And I will um, have Anthony wrap, wrap this up for us. Thank you, guys, for joining us today. This is great. And thank you, everyone, for uh, joining the event.